to the left door, and she will show you where your children will be meeting and where to pick them up at the end of service. Please continue and remain standing out of respect for the reading of God's word. Turn with me to Matthew 25. We're going to begin reading in verse 14. For the kingdom of heaven is as a man traveling into a far country who called his own servants and delivered unto them his goods. And unto one he gave five talents, to another two, and to another one. To every man according to his several ability and straightway took his journey. Then he that had received the five talents went and traded with the same and made another five talents. Likewise, he that received two, he gained another two. But he that had received one went and digged in the earth and hid his Lord's money. After a long time, the Lord of those servants cometh and reckoneth with them. Let us pray. Father in heaven, Open up our hearts and our minds to hear and receive your word this day. That you would receive all glory, honor, and praise. <clears throat> we pray in Christ's name. Amen. You may be seated. Jesus has been teaching about his return. And in the text today, he teaches about something specific that will happen when he comes again. And it has to do with our stewardship. Because the truth of the matter is, in what it all comes down to, is that everything belongs to Christ. Amen. We own nothing. Everything we have comes from Christ. Everything we have belongs to Christ. We're just stewards of that which he has given into our care. And we're going to see from the text today that there are faithful stewards they are unfaithful servants. Beginning in verse 14. For the kingdom of heaven is as a man traveling into a far country who called his own servants and delivered unto them his goods. Jesus here is teaching about a man traveling into a far country, a man taking a long journey, and before he leaves... He calls his servants together and delivers unto them his goods. The reason he does this is so that his things would be managed well while he is gone. The man is obviously referring to Jesus Christ. The far country refers to a long journey that he would go on. He would be gone a long time, is what that refers to. The servants translates the Greek word doulos, which means slaves. So we see here that the man, Jesus Christ, is the master. The servants are the master's slaves. And his goods, as we're going to see in a moment, refers to money, refers to monetary resources. In a corresponding passage of Scripture from Mark 13, verse 34, 
says the Son of Man is as a man taking a far journey who left his house and gave authority to his servants and every man his work and commanded the porter to watch. We see in that passage of Scripture that Jesus delivered unto his servants the work they were to do and the authority they needed to do it. And while he was away, they were to do business until he returns, and they were to be watching for his return. So we see in verse 15, the master, the man traveling to a far country, divides up his goods, says, and unto one he gave five talents. To another he gave two, and to another he gave one. Notice this, to every man his, according to his own ability. That's very important. And straightway, he took his journey. Now I want to talk about this word talent for what it used to mean and what it means today. Today when we think of talents, what do we think about? We think about natural ability, giftedness of some sort or another. We look at those as talents, special abilities that one may have. But the word talent in the original comes from the Greek word talanton, and it refers to a weight of money. A weight of money. There are some very important things we need to notice here. The three servants that are spoken of receive differing amounts of money because the money was given according to each person's own ability to manage those resources. Very important. That means literally that the one who is given more was entrusted with a much higher level of responsibility. He was entrusted with what he could be seen to be expected to handle reasonably, which means that the one who received five talents had the ability to manage a lot, while the one who received two talents had the ability to manage less, and the one who received one talent had the ability to manage less, We have to understood, understand that the resources were given according to each person's ability to manage those resources. Something very important here, we have to notice that these servants will not be judged on how many talents they were given. That number is determined by Christ. They will be judged, however, by what they did with the resources they were given. Notice after distributing his resources to his servants, this man referring to Jesus Christ, straightway he took his journey. He left every servant to manage that which was assigned to him verse 16. Then he that had received the five talents went and traded with the same and made another five talents. And likewise, he that received two, he gained another two also. So we see the servant who received five talents gained five more. He doubled what he'd been given. He used the full advantage what he'd been given. Amen? The servant who received two talents gained two more talents. 
Notice that although he was given much less to work with, he was faithful to use what had been entrusted to his care. We see in both of these servants that they had a definite commitment to serve the master by making the most out of what they had been entrusted with. They were faithful servants. But we're going to see a large, a huge, a big contrast between these two and the third. In verse 18, but he that had received one talent went and dug in the earth and hid his Lord's money. Literally, the servant who received one talent buried that talent. It has to be understood that he had not been given one talent for the purpose of protecting that talent. He had been given one talent for the purpose of using that talent for the work of the kingdom of God. Though he had been given less than the other two servants, he was charged with the same responsibility to use what had been entrusted to him. Notice in verse 19, Christ returns. And after a long time, the Lord of those servants cometh, and he reckoneth with them. Speaks of the return of Christ, tells us of something that will happen when Christ returns. After a long time, refers to the time between the first and second advent of Christ. The time while Jesus is not physically present on this earth. His servants are supposed to be doing the work of the kingdom. They're supposed to be managing well what they had been had entrusted into their care. They're not to be sitting idly by as they await the return of Christ. They were not to be doing nothing with the talent they'd been given. It's extremely possible that what the Apostle Paul writes in 2 Thessalonians chapter 3, verse 10 through 12, has to do with people who were doing just that, sitting idly by, awaiting for the return of Christ. For even when we were with you, Paul writes, this we commanded you, that if any would not work, neither should he eat. For we hear that there are some which walk among you disorderly, not working at all, but are busybodies. What? There were people in the church of Thessalonica that weren't working. What they were doing was becoming gossips, evil mongers. But while followers of Christ await his return, they have a job to do. They have been given the authority to do that job. And they will be judged for their faithfulness or their lack thereof. In Matthew 28, 18 through 20, Jesus tells us about the authority that we've been given. Does he not? Matthew 28, 18, it says all power. That word power translates the Greek word exousia, which means authority. He says, in essence, all authority is given unto me in heaven and earth. Go ye therefore. Therefore is there for a reason. 
it points back to what just was previously said. Therefore, refers to the authority of Christ. That authority has been given to his people. All authority is given unto me in heaven and earth. Go ye therefore and teach all nations. Baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you. All authority was given to Christ. And Jesus says, go ye therefore in the authority of Christ. Do the work of the kingdom. After much time had transpired, notice, so far to this day, it's been nearly 2,000 years. But after much time had transpired, the master appeared. And it was time to account for how the master's resources had been used. This will happen when Christ returns. He will settle accounts. He will receive a report on what the servants did with the resources they'd been given. A reckoning will be made. This is also seen in passages of Scripture such as Matthew 18, verse 23 where it says, Therefore is the kingdom of heaven likened unto a certain king which would take account of his servants. That king is Christ. His servants are his slaves. That's a reference to professing believers. Notice the first two servants received the same commendation from the Lord. Verse 20. And so he that had received five talents came and brought another five talents, saying, Lord, thou deliverest unto me five talents. Behold, I have gained beside them five talents more. There's some things we have to notice here. The first servant came joyfully before the Lord. He came joyfully before the Lord because he knew he had been faithful. He knew he had nothing to be ashamed of. He gave account of how he managed the resources that were placed in his hands. And he did so with joy. This servant is found to be trustworthy because while the master was gone, he was faithfully applying himself to using the resources he had been given, to using the resources that were placed in his care. He had been diligent to apply those resources to the work of the kingdom. He's found to be trustworthy. Some other things we need to notice here. This servant is not boastful. He doesn't praise himself for his success. He has simply done what the master had commanded him to do. To put it in the words of Christ, in Luke 17, 10, Jesus taught that every disciple should have this same attitude. So likewise ye, when ye shall have done all these things which are commanded, you say, we are unprofitable servants. For we have done only that which was our duty to do. We need to notice that at the end of the Apostle Paul's life, the Apostle Paul wrote in 2 Timothy chapter 4, verse 6 through 8, For I am now ready to be offered, and the time of my departure is at hand. I have fought a good fight. 
I have finished the course. I have kept the faith. Paul, in his dying days, expressed a deep sense of fulfillment. He knew he had been faithful to the Master. From Matthew 5, 21, we see that the one who had been given five talents, what Christ would say to him. His Lord said unto him, Well done, thou good and faithful servant. Thou hast been faithful over a few things. I will make thee ruler over many things. Enter thou into the joy of the Lord. This is the same principle that Jesus taught in Luke 16, 10, when he said, He that is faithful in that which is least, a few things, he that is faithful in that which is least is faithful also in much, many things. And he went on to teach, and he that is unjust in that which is least is unjust also in much. We see this servant who had been given five talents because he had been faithful over a few things his master made him ruler over many things. What does that mean? We're going to talk about this now and a little bit later too. His reward for his faithfulness will be that in the millennial kingdom of Christ, he will be given more authority because he was found to be trustworthy when Christ was away. We're going to see that a little bit later. He is promoted to being ruler over many things because he has proven himself to be trustworthy to the Lord while the Lord was away. Notice in verse 22, he also that had received two talents came and said, Lord, thou delivered unto me two talents. Behold, I have gained two other talents besides them. Notice that this servant was given less to work with. He was given less to work with. But the results were the same as the one that had been given five talents. He doubled what his master gave into his care. Two talents became four. And notice that he was full of joy because he had served his master well. He had been true. He had been diligent in furthering his Lord's interests. Again, he had less to work with, but he used his, those talents that were committed to him for the purposes in which they were attend, attended. <coughs> Servant had nothing to be ashamed of when Christ returns. He was found to be trustworthy, worthy of his master's trust. To him also, more responsibility will be given in the kingdom of Christ because of his trustworthiness. Verse 23, to the one that was given two talents, his Lord said unto him, well done, good and faithful servant. Thou hast been faithful over a few things. I'll make thee ruler over many things. Enter thou into the joy of the Lord. Now I want to pause for just a moment at this time to think about this. Think about this for a moment. Christ, 
who is God in the flesh, the creator, the one who is just and holy and perfect, will praise his faithful servants for their faithfulness, even as imperfect as it is. He will praise them. Have you ever thought about that? He will praise his faithful servants. Faithful over a few things, I will make thee ruler over many things. Those who have been faithful in this life as we await the return of Christ will be put in charge of many things in the kingdom of Christ. And that means the following. Faithful servants of Christ who are alive when he returns will be given responsibilities in the kingdom of Christ that are commensurate with their faithfulness in this life. It also means the faithful servants of Christ who will be raptured and they, who will return with Christ, they will also be given responsibilities in the kingdom of Christ that are commensurate with their faithfulness in this life. And to understand better what that looks like, I'm going to refer to Luke chapter 19, verse 12 through 19, where we see Jesus teaching. It's found in the parable of the Minas. There is a man going into a far country. That man is Jesus, going on a long journey. He gave each one of his servants a mina, that is another weight of money. He gave unto his servants a mina to do business with until he returns. When he returns, there is a servant who multiplied his mina tenfold. It is said that he was given authority over 10 cities. In other words, he was given authority in the millennial kingdom over 10 cities to manage and operate those cities. The servant who had multiplied his mina fivefold was given authority over five cities. To manage and have oversight of those five cities. That's what it's talking about. What we do in this life will be rewarded on in the next life. We'll be given greater responsibility for greater faithfulness to God. But we're going to see here what comes next. This third servant, he was very different. Rather than coming before the Lord with joy, rather than coming before the Lord with the knowledge that he had been faithful, this third servant presented Jesus with nothing but insults and accusations. Verse 24 and 25. Then he which had received the one talent came and said, Lord, I knew thee that thou art a harsh man, reaping where thou hast not sown, and gathering where thou hast not sown. And I was afraid and I went and hid thy talent in the earth. 
Lo, there thou hast what is thine. Notice here this servant claimed to know his master, but he didn't know him. Listen to what he said about the master. He, he accused the master of being cruel and ruthless, reaping what did not belong to him, reaping that which he did not plant. And again, as we said at the beginning of this sermon, the truth is that everything belongs to Christ. Amen? Amen. The truth is that we owe nothing Everything that we have came from Christ and belongs to him. The truth is that we are just stewards of what he has given into our care. But this servant, he accused the master of being cruel and ruthless. He slandered the character of Christ claiming that he was unmerciful and dishonest. He had no fellowship with Christ, no personal relationship with Christ. He was afraid of the master. This servant didn't use what he had been entrusted with. He produced nothing for the benefit of the kingdom of Christ. As it's stated in 2 Corinthians 8, 12, if there be first a willing mind, it is accepted according to what a man has, not according to what he has not. This servant had been given one talent that he did not use. He was not of a willing mind. Again, it's important we recognize some are given more to work with and some are giving less to work with. That is not the issue. The issue is this servant produced nothing. He never used the talent for the benefit of the kingdom of heaven. Some other important points I need to make rather quickly. Notice he did not misuse his talent on immorality or selfish pursuits as in the case with the prodigal son. Notice he did not embezzle what he had been entrusted with. He simply had no regard whatsoever for the stewardship he had been entrusted with. Notice he justified himself and he blamed God. He stands before Christ with no joy, no confidence, regarding his account. Instead of rejoicing, he defends himself. He blames the master. He accepts no personal responsibility whatsoever. You made it so that the only thing I could do was dig a hole in the ground and bury my talent in the, in the earth. That was his excuse for his negligence. Then notice, as he calls his master's attention to the bag holding the money, he says, look, here you have what is yours. I didn't keep anything back. You should be thankful that I kept it in tank, in tank. I kept it intact, and then now I return unto you what is yours. 
Notice he recognizes no duty toward his master, no duty toward the work that he was assigned. This, ma this servant is unsaved. He exhibits no faith in Christ. And we have to understand that no genuine servant of God would ever indict Christ for being dishonest. No genuine servant of God would ever slander Christ. Genuine believers praise God for his tender mercies. Amen? Amen. He is merciful. When Job went through the trials of his life, we can see that he often wondered what was going on. But listen to the words of Job very carefully. He never blamed God. From Job chapter 1, verse 21 and 22, Naked came I out of my mother's womb, and naked shall I return thither. The Lord gives, the Lord takes away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. In all this, Job sinned not, nor did he charge God foolishly. In the midst of these trials that Job went through, even his wife said to Job, do you still retain thine integrity? Job chapter 2, verse 9 and 10. Then she said unto him, just curse God and die. But he said unto her, thou speaks as one of the foolish women speaks. Shall we not receive good from the hand of God? Shall we not also receive evil? In all these things, Job did not sin with his lips. But I want us to notice very carefully this third servant characterizes Jesus as being cruel and ruthless. Again, this servant represents those who are unsaved. He claimed to know Jesus, but he didn't know the Lord. He totally shirked the will of God and did his own thing. And he never gave a thought to the fact that one day a reckoning would have to be made. He never gave a thought to the fact that one day he would stand before Christ and give an account. Verse 26. His Lord answered and said unto him, Thou wicked and slothful servant. Thou knewest that I reap where I sowed not, and gather where I have not strawed. Thou oughtest, therefore, to have put my money to the exchangers, that at my coming I should have received mine own with usury. Jesus uses the man's own words to testify against him. The master allows the servant's own words to condemn him. He is wicked. This servant is wicked. He slandered the master. He is slothful. No effort was used to use the talent that was given to him. And even if what he had said about Christ was true, which it wasn't, he could have invested that money in the bank.
and allowed it to gain interest. But he did nothing. Again, having little to work with is no excuse for not using the resources that Christ provides. We notice that two of these servants built their house on the rock. One built their house on the sand. As it's written in Matthew chapter 7, verse 24 through 27. We notice that one of them was the wheat. Two of them were the wheat. And one of them was the tare, the weed as it is written in Matthew 13, verse 24 through 30. Verse 28. Therefore, take the talent from him, the one who had one talent and didn't use that one talent. Take therefore the talent from him and give it unto him which has ten talents. For unto everyone that has shall be given, and he shall have abundance. But from him that hath not shall be taken away even that which he has. Notice the talent was removed from the unfaithful servant. It was given to the servant with ten talents, because those who demonstrate faithfulness to Christ while he is away, will be given even greater responsibilities in the kingdom of Christ. Also, those who trust Christ will gain everything. And those who do not trust Christ will lose all they have. Everyone that has will be given more. Those who have not, what they had will be taken away. Notice something very important. The other two servants, the one that was given the five talents and the one that was given the two talents, they were profitable servants. They were profitable to their master. This third servant is unprofitable. In verse 30, Jesus says, Cast ye the unprofitable servant into outer darkness. The unprofitable servant the one who did not use the talent they were given for the kingdom of Christ. The unprofitable servant will be cast into outer darkness. There shall be weeping and gnashing of teeth. What does it mean to be an unprofitable servant? It means literally to be of no use to the kingdom of Christ. To be cast into outer darkness refers to the spiritual darkness that is outside the kingdom of Christ. The reference to weeping and gnashing of teeth is a direct reference to the agony and torment of eternal hell. That is the destination for unprofitable servants. When the Lord returns, there will be a reckoning. Let us pray. Father in heaven, I do pray that if there are any in our midst or any within the sound of my voice 
who are unprofitable servants. We pray that this would be the day that they become profitable to the kingdom of God. We pray that this would be the day of their salvation. In Christ's name, amen.